This is a production of PBS Charlotte. American Graduate Getting to Work is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Just ahead on Carolina Impact, experts call vaping and e-cigarettes an epidemic in high schools. One in five students are doing it. And have you heard about Goodwill University? It's providing critical training for free that's helping people climb out of poverty. We'll take you inside. And this week, our Bloomy Awards preview takes us to a high school musical that's a little bit DIY and a little bit Project Runway. Carolina Impact starts right now. Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention say that smoking among teens is at an all-time low, down nearly 16% since 2011. That's the good news. The bad news is that e-cigarette use or vaping among teens is skyrocketing. According to the National Youth Tobacco Survey, 21% of American high school students and 5% of middle schoolers are current e-cigarette users, and those numbers are only expected to rise. Carolina Impact's Jason Turzes visited a couple of high schools to find out what's being done to curb this issue. Vaping. Just a few years ago, no one had ever even heard of it. Now it's everywhere, especially among teens. Literally everybody I know has one. They do it. It's, it's fun. In 2017, American consumers bought more than $250 million in vaping products. In 2018, that number quadrupled to $1 billion. It's nicotine disguised with fruity flavors, such as mint chocolate, bubblegum, peach pit, and a slew of others. Creme brulee. And this is blueberry. San Francisco-based company Juul controls over 70% of the e-cigarette market. While they argue their product is meant to help adults quit smoking, others say what it's really doing is hooking kids on nicotine, which is highly addictive. What the tobacco companies figured out was that you know, everybody's got such a negative connotation about smoking cigarettes. Let's create a new, new way to deliver nicotine. A recent study found that American teenagers between the ages of 15 and 17 were 16 more times likely to start vaping than people aged 25 to 34. Everyone does it and like they think it's like so cool and all, so I feel like that's the reason everyone else is doing it. That's led some public health officials to call it an epidemic. Certainly, this is something that we're seeing now, but, but is it really an epidemic? I don't know if it, it meets the criteria for a true epidemic. Is there an increase? Absolutely. Is it really a, a, an epidemic or is it just another symptom of being an adolescent? Unlike cigarette smoke, where the smell is undeniable, vaping can go virtually undetected. We know kids are going into bathrooms at times when they can get in there. We know that kids, even in a classroom, if a teacher's got her back turned or working over with a group on one side of the room, I can do one of these and pretty quickly and nobody even knows about it. It produces little to no smell. The vapor evaporates in seconds and the delivery system can be easily concealed, looking oftentimes like a USB flash drive. Parent sees this. Oh, what is that? Oh, that's a jump drive from my computer. Yeah. Parents don't know. Parents see this. Oh, that's my uh, that's backup battery pack. Yeah. You know, and they look on the bottom, you see the plug? There's even a vape hoodie where the drawstring is really a vape. <laughs> You do have products out there that they can incorporate marijuana or THC into that and be using that as a way to get high while they're at school. Yeah. Uh, and you can't really pick up on the odor of it because it's masked by the liquid that's inside the vape product itself. At Myers Park High School, Dean of Students Pete Geis has bags and bags full of vaping supplies, all confiscated from students over the last couple of years. If they see me coming up, if I see them go like this, I know they're hiding something. We have a right by law to search anybody on campus. We search kids all the time. At Weddington High School, resource officer yeah. Deputy Chris Byram conducts searches, confiscating plenty of vaping products. The school needs reasonable suspicion to search a child, so if, if they have reason to think that the child has a vape product, then they can actually tell the child to empty his pockets. 
Deputy Byram arranges for uh, some of the canine units to come out at certain times to do random searches of, of the lots. We know that kids are, are, are smart and crafty and we know that they've in, in many cases they're probably just they're finding more ways to be careful about concealing their use of these things. Many school districts in the area and nationally have revised smoking policies to include vaping with consequences usually involving school suspension. Official school policy is that this is a, a, a contraband substance. In in addition to the one day of out-of-school suspension, students are required to take a tobacco education course as well. One of the requirements that our district has is that we report every student to our um, substance abuse program that's run by the district. Second violation can go up to um, the uh, can go up to a three-day suspension from school. Weddington's principal, Dr. Jay Jones, recently took part in a community forum involving 11 area counties discussing the issue and what can be done about it. That panel included a number of different people, but one of those people was a uh, pediatrician. So we brought her in and she was able to speak on that panel about, okay, while the body of research may be limited in terms of the long-term effects, uh, we do have some and here's what it's telling us. While hearing from health professionals is always good, Weddington's school officials know the best people to sway opinion are the students themselves. We're in the process of initiating something now where a lot of our highly regarded young people, either from athletics or the arts or kids who do really well academically, um, we are working on some public service announcements in the form of, of some signs and some videos that we're going to do on our closed circuit TV where these kids are saying, look, I uh, just want to let everybody know I'm pledging I'm not vaping and I'm not vaping because I care about my future. Jason joins me on the set now. Talk to us a little bit more, Jason. This is really kind of awkward to understand that there is an age limit to <laughs> purchase the equipment, but not an age limit to actually do the deeds. So yes, to speak. yes. Technically, you have to be 18 to buy. However, just like with cigarettes and alcohol, if there's a will, there's a way. Kids will find a way. Um, you know, if they get caught, they get caught. But you have to be 18 technically to go into a store and purchase. Now, some kids can get around that. Some stores might sell it to them. Um, other kids might ask someone else to do it. So they can usually find a way to get the products. Um, now, there's actually currently a bill being proposed in the U.S. Senate to raise the national minimum age to purchase any kind of tobacco or vaping product from 18 to 21. So we'll see what happens with that. But now, regardless of if that bill goes through or not, Walgreens Pharmacy uh, just announced that it's raising its age to buy any kind of vaping products or tobacco products from 18 to 21. And Rite Aid announced that it's going to eliminate e-cigarettes and vaping products completely over the course of the next three months. But still, if these young people get it, you can be 16, get caught doing it, and there's no penalty. There's no penalty because it's, it's nicotine, so it's technically not, you know, illegal to have. You have to, it's one of those weird, you know, just, you know, you're not supposed to buy it, but if you're caught with it, it's, you know, and that's another problem for the schools because it's so hard to tell now. The schools a lot of times can't tell if, it's, okay, are they, are, they, are they vaping nicotine or are they vaping liquid marijuana? And, you know, huge difference with mm -hmm. that, you know, if kids are getting high while in school, um, but they just kind of send it all, kind of falls under, all under that same umbrella. So you've talked about the increase that schools are seeing, but there are some schools seeing a decrease on campus? The, when I was at Weddington High School and speaking with the principal there, he said that the actual the curve had been going up for years, but this is the first year where they felt it's actually coming down. Now, they're also saying we're not naive enough to think that kids aren't still doing it. Maybe the kids are getting a little more, you know, better with the way. Cunning maybe, about how they do it? Yes, or maybe, maybe not bringing it to school as much because they know the repercussions if they get caught. So it might stay in the car, it might stay at home. But in a general sense, they know that it, or at least they feel it's starting to come down. And they say that the biggest deterrent to all this is really getting the cool kids at school to kind of be the ones to take the lead to kind of say that it's not cool and hoping that that, because the, the peer influence is gonna be bigger than anything. It's gonna be bigger than the parents or the coaches or the teachers saying it, but if it's coming from the peers themselves and they take the vow not to do it, then they're hoping that that would have more of an impact. Kind of like some of the programs that started with students against drunk driving, yes. that is in schools, because when those peers, they just have so much more more power sometimes than we parents, but we can't leave without giving some advice to parents. Well, the, the biggest thing, and it's and it goes, it's it's kind of like the same thing with alcohol, or you know, back in our generation with the, with the smoking, is stay connected to your kids, stay connected, be involved, um, and don't be naive. That's the biggest thing because these things are so hard to detect, and they do look like USB devices or little battery packs. So it's so easy for a kid to say, "Oh, it's nothing. That's just my little flash drive or whatever." be aware and talk to your kids. That's the biggest thing. So whether it's parents, coaches, teachers, um, doctors, or the peers, you gotta stay involved. That's the biggest thing. 
great information. Jason mm -hmm. Terzis, thanks so much for this report. Absolutely. Right now in Charlotte, there are more than 10,000 full-time customer service jobs. But working in customer service can be tough. Often you're dealing with unhappy customers, even angry folks, and training is key. It's also often the first step to higher paying corporate jobs. That's where Goodwill comes in. A part of our American Graduate Getting to Work project, Carolina Impact's B. Thompson tells us how Goodwill is focused on helping people gain good jobs. For many, this is the definition of Goodwill Industries, a place where gently used clothing and housewares are refurbished and sold to help many people on different economic levels and to provide entry-level jobs for others. But take a closer look. The face and the mission of Goodwill has expanded. Now it includes faces and career choices like these. I currently work with Piedmont Airlines as a gate agent. Like many others coming through the doors of the Goodwill campus on Wilkinson Boulevard in Charlotte, Sherba Austin took advantage of a program that's called Customer Administrative and Business Services, or CABS, training. Moving to Charlotte, the former longtime New York City social worker decided her life needed a new direction. It was an opportunity for me to improve my social skills, improve my computer skills, you know, and really get a handle on, on upgrading what I knew or even reinventing myself. Goodwill job training is designed to help those needing a new start to those just getting started. Full-time customer service jobs in the Charlotte area pay twenty to fifty thousand dollars. We knew that we had to offer training that was easy to access at no cost for students and that would meet the needs of the employers in the community. In this day of costly college educations, you heard correctly. Goodwill offers those courses and training free of charge. The three-week programs, and students may need more than one session, place strong emphasis on developing so-called soft skills, communications, problem solving, self-management, and teamwork. And right in there with those other must-learn skills, everything from understanding computer applications to updating that resume. We bring in industry experts to talk about uh, job preparedness tips and tricks and uh, dressing for success. And the students, no such thing as typical. They cover the spectrum of potential employees. In short, this is the face of the community. I'm Jennifer Davis. I've been in the Charlotte area for about five years now. I'm looking to become an IT specialist. I'm Christian Beyer. I'm 18 years old. I'm very inexperienced at, you know, jobs and everything because I really haven't had my first job yet. Well, my name is Serenity Williams. Um, I'm 19. I'm, I just graduated 2018. Okay, how long is that going to take? In the classroom setting, they role play, sharpening their skills, and they attend job fairs with potential employers, businesses that partner with Goodwill to find employees that fit their needs particularly in customer service and information technology. And in talking to those employers, we really asked a lot of questions about what are the skills that your applicants don't seem to have? What are the skills needed to fill the jobs that are open? And the jobs cover a gamut. Service industry can mean working in retail or at the airport or in IT in an office. Goodwill's courses provide the training that allows student clients to cross over into many fields. Problem solving skills, communication skills, networking skills, the ability to work in a team environment. Those are those transferable skills that I think employers, they're really, they really want. So in addition to the set skills that they have on the resume, they have to show up with these transferable skills as well. As the face of employment changes, Goodwill is changing to meet the needs of the community, not only from the employer's perspective, but for the changing students who now need the skills Goodwill can help them attain. For students, that approach has meant a turnaround in life. It became a little discouraging after a while, but now that I'm back on the right track and, you know, I'm going to have the the experience that I need to be able to, you know, get these jobs, you know, I'm not going to be discouraged anymore. Just empowerment. <laughs> For Carolina Impact, I'm B. Thompson reporting.
Thanks so much, B. The job training goes on year round at Goodwill University on Wilkinson Boulevard. There's a cafe as well as a child care center there. Go to our website at pbscharlotte.org on our Carolina Impact page for more details. Well, what does studying history mean to you? It certainly can mean memorizing dates or people's names, but what about natural history? What do you think it was like to live in this region a hundred years ago? There's a special museum in Gastonia that answers all those questions and more in an engaging way. Our Trail of History producer, John Branscombe, takes us inside the Shield Museum. This is Cornelius. Uh, he is a corn snake. Um, he's not full grown. These guys can get five to six feet long. And they actually get their name. You see the bottom of them? It kind of looks like corn or maize. And so that's one reason why they thought they were named corn snakes. My name is Keely Zimmerman. I'm the live animal manager here at the Shield Museum. So that means I oversee our entire animal collection. Uh, we have over 40 species of animals and over 70 something actual animals here at the museum. Zimmerman believes the animals in her care play a vital role in conservation, giving visitors a better understanding of each animal. And I think when they get a chance to, to meet a live animal or see a live animal exhibit and learn about it, they're more likely to hopefully help respect that animal. And um, they want to learn more about why we, why we need this animal, why we should protect it. The museum often works with wildlife rescue groups, giving a home to animals that can't be released again. I don't feel like it's fair to bring an animal in from the wild that could live on its own. Like They're there for a purpose, and the goal through education is to teach about that purpose. And so we utilize animals that couldn't otherwise survive outside, and so they can help tell their story and hopefully in turn help protect those animals that are outside. They have a variety of reptiles, insects, small mammals, and birds on the inside. And at the farm, they have chickens, sheep, and pigs. One of the latest additions to Zimmerman's care makes their home in what looks like a tiny moon base, Costa Rican leaf cutter ants. What I think is super awesome about them is it's just such a cool thing to look up close at. I mean, you can see them cutting those leaves, you can see them moving them, you can see everything happening step by step by step. So my favorite part is really seeing that like light bulb moment that can, you know, light up and that they, they have that ex excitement and they have that passion and they really want to make a difference too. And, you know, the next generation is our future. And so getting them excited and hyped up and, and, you know, liking snakes and not wanting to, you know, kill a snake like their parents do or, or maybe just not even being afraid of snakes like their parents or understanding why we have these creatures um, means the world to me. It's, it's really my favorite part of my job. Blending of history, science, and culture are in the DNA of the Shield Museum of Natural History. Whether it's experiencing reenactments on the farm or finding creepy creatures in the dark, those that work here consider it a privilege. I think the most important thing that we can do at the museum is inspire young people to uh, be hungry for knowledge. To come to work and be able to create, to take ideas, and transform those ideas into experiences that our citizens, our children, uh, really enjoy and benefit from. So the opportunity to take that, that creative energy and, and make something uh, for, for people to come and learn about, uh, to come and see, to come and do, to be excited to come and, and, and experience that product, that's a really cool uh, part of what I personally get to do. It would not be here if it hadn't been for the support of this community, which says to me that this is a place that's been fulfilling the, the needs of our families and our students for a very long time, and it's been a great pleasure to be part of that. Mr. Shield left a wonderful gift uh, in his enthusiasm for the natural world and his interest in the natural world. Um, he has been an inspiration to this community, even for those that never knew him and don't know anything about him, in seeing the museum that grew from his original work, from what he and Lily did, from what they loved, from what they collected. This museum uh, has grown and flourished, and the citizens today, many of which are very far removed from the Shields, continue to benefit from their interest and their legacy.
Thanks so much, John. The full episode of the Shield Museum on Trail of History airs May 7th at 8.30 p.m. Well, we're counting you down to the annual Bloomy Awards right here on PBS Charlotte. The Bloomies honor excellence in high school musical theater. It's our region's version of the Tonys. This week, we take you to Charlotte Catholic High School, where music shares the stage with the sound of saws and sewing machines. Carolina Impact's Jeff Sonier has more. When the curtain opens here at Charlotte Catholic, there's not always an audience on the other side. Could you guys give us some space over here? Could you just shoot basketball on that side? But theater director Marcus Ryder smiles and figures, you know, the show must go on. And when his theater kids without a theater are performing on their stage here in the gym, alongside PE classes and team practices, well. You know, it is, it is what it is. I think we do some of, the, some of our best work underneath that pressure. Don't rely on all I said I saw. This year, their best work is the musical Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat, with senior Andrew Mann in the title role of Joseph. So this year, I get to sing a lot, which is good for me because that's where I'm actually comfortable the most, considering that I don't have acting or dancing experience. I find I relate to Joseph a lot, and it makes the whole acting thing easier for me. <laughs> Junior Gracie Kunick also shares the spotlight, hitting the high notes as one of the musical's narrators. It's so much fun to be a part of the show, and just like being at Charlotte Catholic, it's kind of cool. We get to be a part of every single part of the process. Even if we're on stage, we can also help paint the stage like you just saw people doing. We can, I painted some of those, like the color things, and just, we help with our costumes. In fact, all the costumes at Charlotte Catholic, including more than 30 costumes in this show, are the work of this first period costume design class. It's sort of a high school project runway, with the teacher side by side with the students on sewing machines. Have you done this before? I haven't. I've seen my mom do a lot of hand stitching, and that's really my inspiration. Some of the people that I'm sewing clothes for are my friends, so making something for them is really, like makes me happy. If you mess up, you gotta start over, and especially when making pants, you have to put the right pieces together. Like seeing other people like like make clothes like out of just like scratch is kind of cool. So I was just like, I want to do something like that. You know, sewing and, and costuming is math. You know, building the set that's that's math, I and mean, we're using a heck of a lot of a geometry. Yeah, the stage itself is the classroom for Charlotte Catholic's theater tech class, where kids also learn how to use paintbrushes, power tools, turning the set for this musical into a big do-it-yourself project. You learned so much. Like, I've, I came into this not knowing how to work a drill. Now I know how to work a drill. It's sort of like letting loose, almost. It, you know, you, it's a whole different project, and it's a long-lasting project, and you're doing it with other people that are in the same situation, and you're just putting it together, and it all works out. It's more fun for me than it is work. Um, it's just cool to be able to step, take a step back and look at what you've um, been able to create. We're sort of modernizing it a little bit with some of the, some of the staging and, and um, getting creative, making some bold choices. And I think that's awesome for the students to see that as well, that we can make some bold choices. And we do a lot of stuff in-house, so we, we sort of depend, I depend a lot on the kids, and the kids depend a lot on us, and they depend on each other. I think that's what really what helps to grow that sense of community, because we're, we're in it together. And even if what they have here at Charlotte Catholic is just a stage in a gym, and not an actual theater, well, it's still the theater, and their theater. And that makes all this work on the costumes, on the set, on the stage, all worthwhile. It's like a feeling when you get on stage and it doesn't really matter that anyone else is like watching you, it's like, it's just you. 
you work on a lot of things and you put it all together and then you take a step back at the very end and you look at what you, you've done as a team, it's really, it's incredible. There's really never a, a talk about, I'm so nervous. There's no, no one's really ever that nervous because they've, they've been through the trenches and they're ready to do it. That doesn't bother us. We have that spirit of Charlotte Catholic where we take on the challenge and we overcome it. Well, it's one of my favorite things to talk about every single year. 48 high schools across 10 counties participate in the Bloomy Awards, which premieres only on PBS Charlotte, May 28th at 8 p.m. I'm honored to co-host the event again this year with WBTV's Maureen O'Boyle. You won't want to miss these terrifically talented teens. Well, that's all we have time for this evening. Thanks so much for joining us. We always appreciate your time, and we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. American Graduate Getting to Work is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. A production of PBS Charlotte.